Well, hi everyone and welcome to the iPlant Collaborative uh, webinar. This will be on barcoding techniques. Sort of a, a brief overview of the DNA barcoding sort of introduction, then the method, and then hopefully we'll be able to field any questions that you particularly have. Uh, so if you have some questions during the talk, please feel free to ask them. But please remember that if you have a question to in your, your, your sort of window there at the bottom right hand side or at the bottom of your screen, you know, apply any open forum questions there. If you have a private question, you can. If you experience any stalling, just remember to refresh your screen and then come back in and that should solve your issue. But if you have any other problems uh, in the open forum area, please make an identification so we can help you. There's a bunch of us here on the back end of the screen that can help you. So what I want to do is just get started. So let's take a look at barcoding. Now, if you were to sort of step outside in any part or neck of the woods where you are, you might be able to find a couple of things that are physically here, uh, which is a frog, a butterfly, and a plant here. Uh, but you might not particularly know what this butterfly is, nor would you most likely identify that you probably have some sage to the right there uh, as a plant. But the question is, is, if you did know anything about these, how would you physically approach looking at this? Well, one of the classical ways to do this is through taxonomy. And Carl Linnaeus was sort of our founding father for this particular identification, where we have uh, a genus and species identification, which each uh, an individual uh, grouping that we sort of categorize for an organism. But nonetheless, uh, the idea is that not everyone can be a taxonomist, and nor does any taxonomist uh, know every species that exists, okay? There's probably over two million catalog species, and it's very hard to identify with each and every one of them. So how could we sort of streamline things and make it a little bit more uh, easier for anyone to be able to identify and catalog a particular species? Well, one of the things that we can do is look at a barcode physically. And what Colonnese is holding here is a little piece of paper which has a barcode physically on it. And this is sort of, uh, uh, I guess you can say, a funny cartoon because uh, Paul A. Bear in 2003 uh, published a paper that proposed the use of a molecular signature, which is what he termed as a DNA barcode. Now, this sparked a lot of interest, uh, especially here at Coltsman Harbor Laboratory, because immediately following in the, the subsequent year, uh, we held two conferences which looked at the feasibility of actually using a, a signature in DNA as a way of identifying species. And upon completion of the second workshop or conference, uh, it led to that this is feasible and that we can approach this very easily. But one of the things is, is what do we choose to be essentially a barcode? Now barcodes are very familiar uh, within the, the population. Uh, not necessarily a DNA barcode, but most of us use a UPC code. Now, or barcodes were probably first used in the, in the early 60s to identify with railroad cars and probably a little bit before then. But in the 70s, it became more mainstream when grocery store shelves started to associate barcodes with their food sources, whether it was canned foods or cereals. But the main idea was to automate the idea of identifying a particular product, a cost, and determining how much of that particular product is being pulled off of the shelves. So that automated function made it easier for people to identify with what was physically uh, coming in and coming out and more popular uh, in the individual stores. So why not affiliate that type of thing with DNA and species? And it's actually very easy to do because we have sort of the similar things that a barcode would essentially need. Now one thing a barcode is, is that it's going to be a short standardized region of a gene. And we'll talk about the different genes that we target for different types of organisms. But the general idea is that all these organisms are made up of bases, or A's, T's, C's, and G's. And each one of those bases is a component of the physical barcode because each species has a unique or dynamic sequence of DNA that's organized. Okay? So what has to be special about the barcode? Well, in order for it to be able to sort of transect or go across species, because we're not doing genomics here, we're basically taking one individual section of DNA or a targeted gene and trying to span as many species within the group as possible. So in order to do that, we have to make sure that the barcode is short so that we can at least sequence it in one round, okay? But it has to be long enough to have specificity to a target, okay? It has to be flanked by conserved regions because we've got to land uh, physically through amplification in several different groups. We have to have low intraspecies variation, not to mention that a discontinuous variation between species has to be present. And of course, lastly, we, it has to be easy to approach, meaning that after we land, uh, we have to be able to approach amplification of the product or amplicon very easily. 
So through a simple PCR reaction, we can actually identify many species. Now the different types of genes that we're going to use here are pretty uh, synonymous with different groups, but in plants, although they do have mitochondria, the main target that's uh, identified is RBCL, which is actually a chloroplast gene uh, known as rubisco. Uh, in fungi, we're going to look at a, uh, a, a nuclear ribosomal gene here. We're going to look at an ITS, which is actually an internal transcribed spacer, which is found on the nuclear ribosome. Uh, we're going to look at uh, cytochrome oxidase 1, which is found in many, many different animals. But the idea is we're going to be targeting the mitochondria in many animals. So for plants, we're going to be looking at chloroplasts, fungi, the ribosome. And then for other animals, we're going to be looking at the mitochondria. And this includes vertebrates and invertebrates. Now, by using these individual uh, standardized barcodes, we can essentially add to the library that we physically have. And this is one of the features that barcoding is going to, to add to us. Now, the question here at the top is why barcode species? One, well, like I mentioned in the earlier, end of the, uh, earlier part of the talk, is that not everybody can be a taxonomist, nor does any taxonomist know how to identify every known species. So by having a DNA barcode, you can search a database for relatively easily and identify groups. Well, what if you identified a group and it was new and it wasn't essentially there? Well, now we can actually probe against that database via the barcode and then add that new data as it shows to be uh, a new entry. Now, one of the main things that we're going to be focusing on for this uh, webinar is actually the extraction part, but let's talk about the series of events that's actually going to take place and how barcoding actually works. One, we're going to collect the sample, and that sample can be collected from just about any organism. Just make sure that you're going about it in a, a very respectful way. Uh, nonetheless, the storage of those samples should be kept at maybe minus 80 degrees Celsius in ethanol at the highest concentration, at least above 95 percent, or you will start to uh, experience degradation of the physical sample. But if you're ready to go, you can take the sample fresh and push straight on. The next step will actually be a DNA extraction, and you can use a number of different methods here, but we'll focus on just one, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but the next individual step is actually going to be PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, in which we're going to amplify the short standardized barcoding gene. Okay. Now, after we get the physical barcode or the amplified product, we typically will run this on a gel just to confirm that we have a physical product there. Once that confirmation is seen, we can then move to uh, taking that product and sequencing it through our uh, collaborators at GeneWiz Incorporated. They've offered to give us some de uh, uh, a discounted uh, level of sequencing in which we will get about $3 per sample, uh, and that will allow us to get the forward and reverse read for about $6. So we can see here that we have the, the sequence of our uh, barcode here upon uh, getting the data back from GeneWiz, and then what we can do is proceed with that data straight to DNA Subway where we can actually create phylogenetic trees. Um, this is actually a really uh, important program uh, to the analysis of our data because it allows us to use several different types of programs to both trim and analyze our data altogether. So DNA Subway is actually a suite of programs that allows us to do everything all in one window rather than several. Now, some of the things that we're physically going to need uh, when we get started is that we're going to need some form of extraction method. It can be a kit, which could be Kygen or Promega, which are some of the things that we've used here at, uh, back at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory for uh, some of our projects like the Urban Barcode Project in Manhattan. Uh, you will also need uh, a PCR machine and some reagents uh, for that, for the amplification. So you'll need some primers and tack polymerase and such. But you'll also need to set up accounts with GeneWiz so that you can do the DNA sequencing. And that can all be found uh, on our DNA Barcoding 101 website, which is found back at the main page on the DNA Learning Center, which is the main page there in the center. Of course, we're going to need bioinformatic tools. And bioinformatic tools are found at DNA Subway or dnasubway.org. And of course, if you want to sort of gather all these pieces of equipment in one shot just to do the extraction and begin to going to do the, the sequencing. Carolina Biological actually sells a kit that we've put together uh, for DNA barcoding and it can help you with the physical reagents for isolation and then moving on into the PCR reaction and then confirmation uh, of the individual uh, amplicons or uh, barcode products. Now, I said in the beginning here on this first bullet that we were going to actually need to do uh, a DNA extraction. And I mentioned that you could use a kit, but I 
don't want to take that away from you, but one of the things I do want to show you is that you actually could do your own uh, home recipes in which we're trying to actually push the use of uh, a silica DNA isolation. Uh, here I have uh, some graphs uh, depicting uh, a home DNA, a home cookbook DNA isolation method versus some commercial kits that are physically available to you. And if you take a look here, you can see uh, the green bar represents silica and then the red is chiogen and the promega in this graph uh, is blue. But what I want you to see is that as we go through here, the silica, which is in green, is pretty much uh, showing a very high uh, percentage success rate in comparison to its commercial counterparts. Uh, except in vertebrates, we see that it's slightly lower than in the chiogen kit, but nonetheless, the silica isolation is showing to be just as efficient or better uh, than the commercial kits which are there. So we were pleased to see that from plants to vertebrates to fungi that we were getting a high success rate of DNA isolation and subsequent PCR uh, amplification after the silica DNA isolation. The other question was, could we get uh, effective isolation from different types of preserved samples, whether or not they were, uh, as shown over here to the right, in ethanol, were they frozen, were they dry, or were they fresh? So in any one of those individual four states, what success rate would we have for DNA isolation and then a subsequent PCR reaction? So what we can see here is that Promega uh, is in blue, Kyogen is in red, and then we have silica in green here. And we can see that Kyogen is exceeding all of the uh, commercial kits that we have represented here, and it's showing that it's actually a, a superior method uh, in many cases. Now, not only did we see that the silica method was exceeding or doing pretty well successfully with both preserved and a numerous uh, range of samples. We looked at cost and cost, uh, it was very uh, efficient, uh, the cost, okay, in the sense that if we looked at a silica reaction, uh, it was about less than 30 cents to, to do a sample, whereas if we looked at Promega, it was like a dollar eighty maybe, and then for Kaijin, a little over three dollars. So when we look at the, you know, overarching picture here, it's not only effective, but it's also cost efficient. You know, we're really sub substantially decreasing the, the amount of money that would actually go out per reaction. So in this particular uh, webinar, we're actually going to look at the silica DNA isolation as a technique for DNA barcoding. So there's a few things that we're going to need to physically do this uh, experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk over and we're going to get started with this DNA isolation. Okay, so we're going to get started, but you can see that I have a lot of equipment physically here to do this DNA isolation. Uh, so one thing I do want to promote is safety in the laboratory. So one thing that I do recommend is that you're going to need some gloves to physically wear. So I'm going to put these on. And you should also be wearing some type of protective uh, eyewear, whether it be gl uh, you know, glasses or lab glasses or lab goggles. But you, know, you need to make sure that you're wearing something protective over your eyes. Okay. I'm wearing my glasses, so I think I'll push on with that. All right. So let's talk about everything that you're going to physically need here. First things first, you're going to need some samples. So I have three sets of samples here, and I have some plants, uh, some sort of meat. This is pork, actually, and I have an insect here, which is actually going to be my house cricket. I'll pull these out in just a second, but we still have a numerous other things to physically go through here. One of the things I will propose is you've got to have a notebook around. You've got to be able to jot down notes about your material, so please have your notebook nearby so that you can keep notes of everything that's happening. You're obviously going to need something to write with, so you should have a pen around and a marker. This will allow you to label your samples. And then you should have your protocol available to you with any notes that you need on that as well. So please make sure you have all these things physically around with you. Okay. Now, let's get to the immediate things that we need. We're going to need some reagents. So I have a set of reagents over here that I'm physically going to need. Uh, this is going to comp uh, comprise of lysis solution. So I have my lysis solution, which is actually going to allow me to help break up uh, the membrane and release the contents of my physical DNA. Okay. I'm also going to have the silica resin physically here. And if you can take a look at this stuff, it it's really milky. Uh, it looks sort of like butter, buttermilk. This is also known as glass milk. But it's sort of thick, but looks very milky when you're physically in here. Okay. So silica resin will be the second reagent we use. We're going to need wash buffer, which I usually keep on ice. It should be very cold when you do this reaction. So you are going to need some wash buffer for this particular experiment. 
And then lastly, we're going to need something to elute the DNA off of our silica resin, and we're just going to use distilled water for that. Okay. Now, of course, my test tubes are really large, but yours may be small because you only need small aliquots to actually proceed on with this experiment. But nonetheless, we have all the reagents that we physically need here. Now, hard equipment, we're going to need some pipetters. We should have a P1000, which will go from 100 to 1,000 microliters. We are going to need a P100, which is going to go from 10 to 100 microliters. And we're going to need a P10 which is going to go from 10 microliters, oh, I'm sorry, 0.5 microliters to 10. If you notice, I also have the tips that correlate to each pipette as well. So make sure you have that available to you. All right. You're going to see that we need some forceps. And for each sample, I recommend having a clean set of forceps. Okay. You don't want to have any cross-contamination in the experiment. So please make sure all these utensils are washed and autoclaved before you get started. Okay. You will also need a pair of scissors or maybe even a razor blade, this will allow you to cut tissue or separate tissue very cleanly, but make sure that these also as well are cleaned uh, very, uh, very well, either bleached or soaked in something that's going to remove any residual DNA that's essentially there. We should have a rack with some test tubes available to us. I recommend having at least three test tubes, but two will suffice. The idea is that we're going to go through a series of steps where we're extracting physical DNA, and we're going to want to make sure we're collecting and discarding any material that's not necessary. We are also going to need a beaker of crushed ice, which you saw me put the wash, uh, the wash buffer into. That's to make sure we keep things cold. But we also are going to need some autoclaved pestles. Okay? So you're going to want to make sure you have clean pestles to work with for each experiment. Okay? So I'm just going to put these out because I'm going to need them. Now, some other pieces of equipment that I have over here that are sort of like uh, pushed to the back here is I have my vortexer. If you do not have a vortexer, finger vortexing will work just as well. I just, all I want you to do is just basically use your finger to tap onto the test tube, and you'll see me do that as I go through. I'll make sure I demonstrate both methods that are physically there. And then, of course, lastly, I need physically to have a microcentrifuge, and I'll have one here. doesn't matter which one you have, but we need to be able to spin at least at 8,000 RPM. Okay. Now, lastly, when you're done isolating your DNA, you can physically move over to doing PCR. And I have a thermal cycler over here, but you can use any set of PCR reagents to amplify the target from your DNA, but you will need a PCR machine to amplify the product and then lead to subsequent identification on some type of matrix, whether you have an agarose gel in the classical manner, or you will be moving on to using some other form of an electrophoresis box in which you can use a product like an e-gel, which is sold by Invitrogen. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to get started, and I'll show you how to do the isolations from all three of these types of, of tissue here. Okay. Now, one other thing that I'm going to need, which is over here to my left, is an incubator. And there are two main temperatures that we're going to have to focus on. And one will be 65 degrees Celsius, and that will be the first temperature we use. And then you'll have to have another water bath available at 57 degrees Celsius. If you don't have two water baths, give time for you to allow the first water bath to move down from 65 to 57 degrees Celsius uh, so that you can have the proper incubation times throughout. If you leave your samples on ice, it's not going to make that much of a deal, or you can even leave them at room temperature. But please allow for the temperatures to get uh, met before you do the main incubations. Okay? Now, what I want to do here is get started. So I'm going to put a garbage beaker here to my left, because I will need to have some disposal area. So the first thing I'm going to go for is the plant. And what you see here is I have just a leaf from a tree that I plucked outside. But you can see that it's not very shiny. Uh, and this actually is a, a really good plant to pull from. If you see something that's really shiny, uh, it might have like a lot of um, carbohydrates or things like polyphenols, which are contaminants. And it actually may make this a little bit tougher or harder to physically work with. So you're going to be mindful that you might want to do a little bit more harder crushing when you have a more uh, rough plant. Okay? But I'm just going to collect some tissue from this plant here. And typically from a plant, what I like to do is collect a hole punch. And I don't want to go making a whole bunch of different types of hole, bunch, hole punches available to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sterile tip out of my tip box, and I'm going to use just this large opening here in the front to allow me to punch a hole into my physical tissue here. So what I'm going to do is move over to my tissue here, 
and I'm just going to press down into that tissue really hard and make just a twist or a circular motion here. And the idea is to create just a punch of that tissue. Okay? So now I have a little bit of a punch of that tissue, and now I'm just going to basically go in there with my forceps and grab that tissue. There we go. So now I have my little piece of leaf, and that's all we physically need is that little bit of, of a punch. Okay? We don't need any more than that. Okay? Any more than that is going to be problematic. We don't want to introduce more contaminants. So the smaller the piece, the better. But this is about the right size and will lead to us getting a really good product. So what I'm going to do is take one of my test tubes now, and I'm going to add my, my tissue. Okay? So my tissue is now in that test tube. I can put my forceps down, and now I can label this individual test tube. This will be sample number one. Make sure you label the top and the side, and also that it is a plant. Okay? So here's sample number one. Sample number two uh, is some meat. And this is actually, I believe, some pork. And all I want to do is show you how much of the sample you should physically have when you go in here. I'm just going to pull out a little bit of this. Okay. And as you can see, depending on the type of meat that you choose here, whether it be beef, steak, or fish, it'll come out in a different manner. But what I want you to get into the habit of is noticing that this material needs to be only about the quarter of a size of a, uh, an eraser. So we don't want to essentially uh, take too much material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my little razor blade here, and I'm just going to cut off a small amount of material that I want to play with here. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to point here. And this is all that I physically want to phys work with here. It's just this little bit of section right there. So I'm going to clean off my forceps here. So I don't need all this stuff here. Right? So all I want is that piece right there. I don't want any more than that. Okay? Any more than that, I might have a problem. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that piece. And I'm going to add this to my next test tube. And then I'm going to label this sample number two. And this is my pork. All right. Now the last sample that I'm going to work with here is my insect. And this is actually a house cricket. This is something you can find around the yard. And all I really want from the house cricket is a leg, OK? And you're going to see that the cricket pretty much has enough material for you to work with. Do not take from the body, because this actually will add problems or contaminants to the, the, the reaction. So all I want to do is take a leg. And a leg will most likely be more than enough to do this experiment. Now I have a piece of my leg or a portion of the leg. And that will be enough to do my reaction. So I'm going to take that. And I'm just going to add that to my next test tube. Now, you may wish to add two legs, one leg. You can pretty much use any particular uh, number between one and two legs. But if you have a large back leg, like for example, the cricket here has a large set of back legs, you can use one of those or two of the small legs here in the front. So one of the back legs or two of the small legs physically in the front. Okay. I just took one of the front legs, but that is going to be just enough for me to physically work with here. So I'm going to label this my sample number three, and that this is an insect. Okay. So I have samples one, two, and three ready to, to get started. And now I can start adding my uh, individual reagents. The first thing that I'm going to start working with is my uh, lysis solution. And I'm going to add 300 microliters of my lysis solution uh, into each test tube. So I'm going to start by working with my P1000. And I'm going to take out 300 microliters and add this to each individual tube. 
It's going to be important that you make sure that your sample is submerged inside of the lysis solution. So if you have to while you're in there, push your sample down with your tip. But if you notice, I'm changing tips each time that I'm going through, making sure that I'm not cross-contaminating. And then finally, we'll do the last sample. OK. Now, once you have each sample physically submerged, we're actually going to use the pestles now to physically crush each sample. It's important that you give a really thorough uh, round of crushing so that you can get the maximum amount of release of the DNA in there, or at least that we're destroying most of the cell membrane so that we can extract the DNA, because we are going to do an incubation on top of the, the crushing. So we're going to grind the tissue with our pestle here. So please make sure that the tissue is at the bottom of the test tube and that if not, you push it down with your pestle. But what I like to do is trap the sample at the bottom of the test tube. And then what I'm going to do is press really hard and twist. What you should notice is that the tissue starts to break up, and even the color of the sample will start to change. And it will be releasing whatever is on the inside of your sample at that time. Since I'm using a plant here, my solution is starting to turn green but your sample may turn red or brown depending on what other organism you're working with. Okay, Make sure the tissue is pretty well ground up and that the tissue is pretty unrecognizable at the end of this. Okay, I will reiterate to forcefully grind while you're in here. Don't give a small amount of grinding up and down. Make sure you're pressing down and twisting very hard. Okay, That's sample number one. I'm going to close that up. And I'm done with this pestle, so I'm just going to push it to the side. Sample number two is my meat. And again, you're going to want to make sure the tissue is back down at the bottom of the test tube. But you're going to notice that most meats do grind up very easily inside of this ly lysis solution. So please make sure that you get thorough grinding, but that most of the tissue is nice and evenly mixed into the solution. So once I've ground up the the tissue, and I can see that it's broken up pretty well. I can then stop and then move on to the next sample. So I'm going to do my insect last. The insect legs like to float, so please make sure you push all the, the legs down to the bottom, and then press really hard and grind. Please make sure that you break up the insect leg rather well because the exoskeleton is a little rough. And once you can see that it's broken up pretty well, you can stop and then move on to the next individual step. I'll take this and push this down. Now, at this time, you're going to actually put your samples into incubate at 65 degrees Celsius for about 10 minutes. This is going to allow further uh, lysis of all the membranous material so that we can extract more DNA. So I'm going to take my samples at this time and put them into my water bath. Now, if you wish to, you can put your samples into a vortexer to mix them a little bit more thoroughly, or you can finger vortex uh, just by hand or taking your test tube like so and banging the bottom of it just to make sure that everything is thoroughly mixed. Or even if you see things are at the top of the test tube, you can take your test tube and flick it downward to make sure that everything's at the bottom. You do not want to put your samples into the centrifuge, obviously, because you don't want to spin everything down. But just a gentle flick downward will bring any excess material back into the main solution area. And then you can incubate. Okay. So after we incubate for about 10 minutes, we will take our samples out. And at this point, all of the tissue should be essentially uh, broken up and has released a lot of the DNA into the solution. So what we're going to do is open up our microfuge, and we're going to place our test tubes in a balanced configuration. Now, what I'm going to do here is make sure I'm placing my test tubes uh, in an orientation to where the hinges are pointing outward. So I'm going to make sure that this hinge is pointing outward towards me, 
what this is going to do is just make sure that all the debris is along that side and that I have a clear solution at the top. This is just a reference for now, but it's going to be even more important when we actually move to doing the silica DNA isolation. Okay, so we're going to need to make sure that this hinge is physically pointing outward. Now this spin is going to be for about one minute, but we're not going to do completely a one minute spin here, but we need one minute at at least 18,000 RPM or higher to make sure that we get all the cell debris towards the bottom of the physical test tube here. Now once all of the debris is at the bottom of the test tube, we're then going to be able to extract the supernatant, which is actually physically on top, and that's what we want. The rest of the test tube is actually ready for the trash bin. If you're worried that you might make a mistake along the way, always keep uh, the remaining portion of the supernatant because the simple fact is that if you lose the first set, you'll always have a backup because we're only going to use half of it. So I'm going to take my first test tube out, and this is my sample number one, and I only want to take 150 microliters of the clear lysate, which is here. So you can see the debris at the bottom that we mentioned previously. and you can see the supernatant, which is clear on the top. Now it's not gonna be completely clear, but it's actually free of debris, okay? And I'm gonna go and grab 150 microliters of that. So I'm gonna set my pipetter down to 150 microliters, and I'm gonna transfer 150 microliters of this lysate into a fresh test tube. Now be sure not to disturb the pellet at the bottom because we don't want any of that debris. And I'm going to add this to a fresh test tube. So now that I've added that supernatant to a fresh test tube, I do need to label it. That's one. And that it is my plant. But I also want to make sure that I'm taking the old. I can either store it, or if you don't, if you're sure you're not going to need it, you can throw it away. I'm just going to push it off to the side because I probably may need it in the future. I'm going to go to sample number two, do the same thing. I'm going to take 150 microliters from this test tube. Okay. Now what I notice from this sample here is I have just a little bit of a debris at the top of the supernatant. That's okay, push through the supernatant, I mean push through the little bit of debris at the top of the supernatant and go into the main clear area and draw up your sample. It's okay that we have a little bit on the outside, we'll be sure during the transfer that we don't pull that over. So what I'm going to do here is not touch the inside of the test tube with my tip, I'm just going to release the contents of my, test, of my, uh, of my tip into the test tube here. And then work my way out of there. So what I did is I minimized the uh, exposure of the material that was on the outside of my tip to my test tube and only deliver the clear lysate or the liquid. Let me get rid of this. And of course I've got to label my sample. This is going to be S2. Now lastly I'm going to go to my insect. As you can see all the, again all the debris is at the bottom of the test tube. And I'm going to collect the clear lysate at the top. And this is going to be my sample number three. And this is my insect. All right. So I have my three test tubes that have my uh, essential supernatant that I need. And it has my DNA inside of there. So now I need to go and collect that DNA. And I'm going to bind all that DNA up by adding my silica resin. So I'm going to take the silica resin at this moment. And I'm going to only going to use three microliters of it. So now I'm going to need to shift over to my P10 which is already set to three microliters, and I'm going to add three microliters of silica resin to each sample. 
Now, one thing I want you to be sure of is that when you have the silica resin that you've mixed it up pretty thoroughly, uh, it sometimes can have a sediment which falls to the very bottom. So if you haven't mixed this very well, when you sort of flip and flip back, you're gonna see that there is sort of a paste at the bottom of the test tube. If you can, hand vortex, if at all possible, or if you have a vortexer itself, please use that to mix up your physical sample. But let's try to avoid having a sediment of, of material at the bottom of the silica resin test tube. Should not have this when you're working in the classroom because you will have a smaller aliquot of this. I'm going to continue to add this to my other test tubes. All right, so that's the last test tube. And what I want to make sure is that the silica resin actually gets mixed rather well with the tissue, or with the, the supernatant, not the tissue. But the idea is that the silica resin is sort of just going to float around in there. But what I want to do is make sure it evenly distributes across the sample set, because there's a lot of resin uh, inside of here. So what I want the sample to do is to turn from sort of this clear lysate to a sort of uh, cloudy solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to finger vortex here. And you can see that my solution now is a little cloudy. And this is actually very important to show that you've actually mixed the silica resin very well. And this allows the silica resin to distribute throughout the entire supernatant and bind up as much DNA as physically possible. I'm going to move to doing this also for my other two samples. So I'm going to finger vortex this one. And that one's pretty mixed really easily. And for the last one, I'm going to just use a vortex. If you have a vortex, it actually works rather, rather well and rather quickly. But nonetheless, you can do a finger vortexing very quickly. Okay? And I've mixed my sample here. Now, after you have all of your sample test tubes mixed, you're going to then want to incubate them briefly at about 57 degrees Celsius for about 5 to 10 minutes. So now I'm going to take these samples and shift them over. So let's take them over. and place them into the incubator. At this time, you'll just want to make sure that you have everything else that you need set up and then move on to the physical next step. Now, we're not going to wait the full five or ten minutes, but we're going to shift over to doing the next part. Now, obviously, we had gave time for the silica resin to bind DNA, but we're going to have to clean the silica resin as well. So we first need to remove it from the supernatant or remove the supernatant from the presence of the silica and then wash the silica resin itself. So let's do the first step, which is actually to get the supernatant away from our silica resin. So I'm going to place our test tubes back into the microfuge in a balanced configuration and spin them briefly. You only need to do this for about one minute or 30 seconds, but you need to exceed about 8,000 RPM. What this is going to do is make sure that we pellet our resin down to the bottom of the tube. But one thing that I mentioned a little bit earlier is that your test tube has a hinge on the very top of it. And you're going to want to make sure that your hinge is facing out towards you so that you can see that the pellet is underneath that area of the test tube. So it's going to be very important that you physically see that. Okay. So please make sure that you're right facing that hinge right at the bottom of your test tube. Okay, so these hinges are facing outward towards us so that we can find our silica pellet right underneath it. And what we're going to do is remove the supernatant. By removing the supernatant, we're removing large amounts of contamination that would be present. But then we're going to follow that by some washing steps, which should remove excess contamination around the pellet as well. So as you can see here, I have my silica resin at the bottom. It does have a little bit of green in there, but that's okay. But I want to make sure that that pellet, which is at the bottom of my test tube, is going to be void of the supernatant. So I'm going to take this out of there. So what I'm going to do is switch over to using my P1000 one more time. I'm going to draw the full 150 microliters of the supernatant out of there. I want to try and get as much out of there without disturbing the pellet, so do not touch the pellet at all. 
remove as much of that liquid as possible and expel that into a garbage bin. And then I'll place this here and we'll do the same for the other two test tubes that we're physically working with. Please be sure to make sure that you're changing tips each time because we don't want to introduce any contamination and this is a crucial step at this point. Okay. Now one thing, if you can actually zoom in on here, is that I have my test tube with my resin at the bottom and you can see a really clear visible pellet at the bottom of the test tube. So this is something that's really nice about the silica resin is that you're always going to have a pellet and you know that on that pellet should be bound DNA, which is a nice feature. Okay. Now to each of these pellets, I'm going to add some wash buffer. So I'm going to go to my ice cold wash buffer over here to my left and I'm going to add 500 microliters of this solution to each of my test tubes. I'm just going to open up all my test tubes here on the table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw up 500 microliters of my wash buffer. And I'm going to add that to each test tube. Again, be mindful to make sure that you're changing tips each time that you add wash buffer to each test tube. Okay, I've added wash buffer to each individual test tube. I'm just going to place that back on ice because I still want it to be very cold. And I'm going to close these test tubes up. Now the objective here is just to wash the pellet. If you can get the pellet fully resuspended, that's great. If not, that's okay. We just want to have the pellet lift up and sort of mix around. So when I'm in here, I can either finger vortex while I'm here. And I actually want to see that the pellet gets moved or lodged. Okay. And it's actually starting to dislodge now. It may take a few taps, but there actually is a pellet physically in there moving around. Okay. Now, if you don't want a finger vortex, of course we can use the machine, which actually would be much easier to do overall. And that gets dislodged pretty easily. Okay. The last thing that you can physically try to do is to take a P100, set to 100 microliters, and we can try to physically get down in there and pipette the pellet up and down. So I'm going to go in here with my pipetter and all I'm going to do is draw up the silica resin and pipette it back and forth. And here you can see that I'm actually breaking up the silica resin pellet once again and it's distributing throughout the liquid here. And this is good because we're getting good washing across all the way. So you can also invert a few times to make sure that you're getting good mixture after that type of isolation or after that type of wash, okay? Now, once we're done with this uh, first uh, resuspension in the wash buffer, we're then gonna place the, the sample back into the microfuge and spin down the samples. This is gonna allow us to repellet uh, the sample back down to the bottom of the, the test tube with our DNA and we're going to take that wash buffer off and wash one more additional time. It's important that we have these two separate washes because each wash will independently take more contaminants away with it. Doing just one large wash will not do this because it potentially will leave contaminants still around, more contaminants around rather than if you did two washes independently. Okay, So it'll be very important to do two washes and not one single large wash. You get more off with two independent washes. Okay, so now once this is complete, you should see once again that there actually is a pellet at the bottom of the test tube. And here's my plant pellet. You can see that it's still a little green. It's pulling over some stuff. but we want to make sure we continuously see a silica resin pellet as we physically go through the stages. So 
I'm going to open this up and I'm going to take off the wash buffer. I'm going to use my blue pipe header still set to 500 and that should allow me to take off the majority of the liquid. Remember not to pull up anything that's associated with the pellet. Leave the pellet alone. We don't want to disturb it. Now since this is the first wash, if you see that there's a little bit of liquid left over, that's okay. I'm not worried about 10 microliters of liquid in this first wash. However, in the second wash when I go to remove it, I want to make sure I get everything off and we'll talk more about that as we get there. But don't worry about it after the first wash. We're going to add another round of wash buffer to this at a volume of 500 microliters for a second wash to make sure that we're cleaning our silica resin pellet nice and easy. So make sure you're adding your wash buffer to each test tube sterilely still. I'm basically done with my silica resin and my wash buffer. And I'm also done with my lysis solution, so I'm just going to push those off to the side. So I've added the wash buffer, the second round. Okay. And again, you're going to want to make sure that you get the pellet resuspended. And then place it back into the centrifuge, because we are going to have to pellet it once more. Okay. Can not use just a vortexer, but you can hand vortex, get things to lift up. And then, of course, you can pipette up and down as well. At this point, you're going to want to spin your sample. And this last spin is going to ensure that we have. Hold on one second. OK. This last spin is going to ensure that our pellet is back down at the bottom of the test tube. And at this point, we're going to try and make sure that when we take off the supernatant or the wash buffer in this final wash step, we're going to make sure that it's completely off. We're going to make sure that it's as dry as it possibly can get. Okay. Now, uh, we don't want to let the pellet dry too long. Okay. I would not let this dry more than about two to, to three minutes max uh, to ensure that you don't over dry the pellet and don't allow for DNA to be fully eluded off of the, the resin. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop this and just making sure we have enough time to make sure that all the silica resin is actually attached very well to the bottom of the test tube. You may have to do two rounds of spinning to ensure that you get all of the wash buffer physically off because we don't want any of the alcohol inside of the wash buffer to be still around or present. We want to make sure that it's as free of alcohol as possible during the elution because that will physically allow for you to get the greatest amount of DNA yielded at the end. So I'm going to take sample number one. And what I want to make sure of is that I go in there with my large pipetter. Draw off all the liquid, as much as I can get. Remember not to disturb the pellet. Okay. Now, the la one of the things I mentioned is that we have to make sure we get all the alcohol or all the wash buffer physically off because we want to elute the DNA next. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to place these back into the centrifuge one additional time. And I'm going to give them a brief spin. This brief spin is going to physically allow me to get the remaining portion of liquid back to the bottom of the test tube so that I can remove that material. At this point, I would like you to switch to a P100, which is going to allow us to get a smaller tip in there and remove the, the smaller amount of liquid. My pipetter here is still set to 100 microliters, my P100. And I'm just going to remove that tiny amount of liquid that still remains there and then allow this to sit at my bench with the test tube open. As you can see here, there's probably a little bit, you can probably see that there's a little bit of liquid still left in there. What I'm going to do is take my P100 tip and work my way down away from the, the pellet and slowly lift up the rest of that liquid. And then leave this open on the table. As I'm moving from sample to sample, depending on how many I have, my, my sample is actually drying along the way. So I've removed the last bit of uh, wash buffer from my last test tube. And then at this point, you can allow them to sit to dry for about that two to three minutes, which will allow most of the alcohol to physically evaporate off. Okay? At that time, you can then move to eluding the DNA off of the, the silica resin. And just to do that, we can use water or DH2O. You can choose to use Tris and EDTA or just Tris at 10 millimolar. So what I'm going to do is with my pipetter, my P100, set to 100 microliters still, I'm going to add 100 microliters of distilled water into each of these test tubes. I'm going to make sure I add my water directly to the pellet. And then I'm going to pipette up and down while I'm in there, disrupting my silica resin pellet as I'm here. You can see that I'm pipetting up and down. And I'm basically trying to get my pellet to go back into solution. Okay. It's giving you a little bit of trouble. You can finger vortex. But what I like to do is to basically, with my tip, get down in there and try to crush this pellet back into solution. Now, once you can see that's back into solution, you can either finger vortex and make sure you're getting good mixing, or you can go back to your vortexer itself to ensure that you got proper mixing. I'm going to place that down and eject off my tip and move to the next test tube. I'm going to draw again another 100 microliters of my distilled water, and I'm going to add that to the next test tube. And I'm basically going to break up the pellet you can see here that I've broken up my pellet. Solution got really cloudy. And just want to make sure it's thoroughly mixed. So you can either finger uh, vortex or vortex on the machine once again. And then place that back in your rack. And we'll continue to do that for everything. So we'll finish out that way. So we're just going to make sure everything gets broken up here. OK. At this point, you want to make sure that you want to check every portion of your protocol that you've actually physically covered it towards the very end. And one of the things that you can physically do is that you can actually just move on with the extraction here physically, or you can incubate your test tube for about another five minutes at 57 degrees Celsius to ensure that you've eluded the majority of the DNA. Typically, I don't have to do that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take my test tube that I've eluded the DNA from. and put that into my microcentrifuge and give one last spin. This spin should be substantial so that you make sure that you've pelleted as much of the silica resin as possible because you do not want to carry this over into your final DNA prep because the PCR reaction is going to have a problem. So you want to make sure that you've spun this down for at least one minute at the highest speed that you can get, at least over 8,000 RPM. And this will ensure that all the silica resin is at the bottom of the test tube.
Now, although we put 100 microliters of fluid in there to ensure that we don't pull any of the silica resin over, I'm gonna say dial your pipetter down to about 90 microliters so that we only pull up 90% of the actual sample here. This will make sure that we don't go into the pellet and draw up anything that could be potentially bad. So I'm gonna take my sample number one here, and I'm gonna transfer that into a new test tube. Remember, you just want 90 microliters of the clear liquid. You don't want any of that contaminating material at the bottom. If you notice that you're starting to get some of that material to come up into your tip, avoid it at all costs and transfer into a new fresh tube. And I'm gonna label this sample number one, but I'm gonna put an F on this one because it's my final sample. This is my plant. I'm gonna move to sample number two. And I'm gonna draw 90 microliters out of there. And there I can get almost a full 90. I'm going to add that into my new test tube. And this will be sample number two, and it's my final. And this was my meat. Finally, I'll move to the insect. And I'm just gonna label that sample number three final, and that's my insect. That essentially concludes the silica DNA isolation in which you have your DNA now soluble in water, okay? You can freeze this down in minus 20 and it will stay stable relatively long, but I do recommend it with fresh samples going straight to the PCR amplification so that you can get your PCR product, confirm it on a, a gel or some other matrix, and then move on to sequencing after confirmation of a PCR product. But this actually concludes the silica DNA isolation. And if you have any questions, I'll happily field them at this time. I see someone's typing. Hope everybody enjoyed it. All right, thank you. So I think there's going to be a download for the protocol so that you can see the physical reagents. Uh, the protocol will be up onto the website relatively soon, so please keep an eye out for it. But there is going to be a, a download for you to physically look at for this isolation from this webinar. So how would I determine uh, the species of a sample? Well, after we physically isolate the DNA and amplify the, the actual barcode or the target gene, we'll then have to blast samples against a database at NCBI, or you can blast uh, samples against uh, the BOLD database, and you can identify species that are already known. Or if your species barcode is not available, you can essentially identify a new barcode for new entry. Any other questions? <laughs>
All right. You're welcome. I think we have a question. So the question we have is, why did the silica separate from the DNA in distilled water with centrifugation so easily? So the silica resin actually isn't soluble in water. So the only thing that is soluble is the DNA. And the idea is that when we're in the lysis solution, the lysis solution actually cross bridges the DNA to the silica resin. And in the presence of water, we lose that cross bridge and the DNA releases. Since DNA is very soluble in water, it dissolves, but the silica resin is not. So we can actually sediment the silica resin back down to the test tube. Looks like we have maybe one more question. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Any other questions? All right. Hope you had a good time. Bye-bye.